Good morning. Today's topic is adolescent gynecology. It is a very important and also an interesting topic. Adolescence is a period of life during which a carefree child becomes a responsible adult. It roughly ranges from the age of 13 to 19 years, that is the teenage. The adolescent girls are brought to gynecological OPD for various reasons of that most frequent and most important reasons for which they are repeatedly coming to OPD are the menstrual problem, urinary compliance, pain in the abdomen, and frequently for discharge per vagina. The term adolescence derived from the Latin word adolescer, which means to grow into maturity and adulthood. It's a word derived from the Latin. This adolescent period is a stressful period of life characterized by many needs and changes that place specific demands on the individual. About one fifth of the world's population, that is about a million, is between the age of 10 and 19 years. As these individuals mature and become sexually active, more young people face a serious health risk. And most faces these risks with too little factual information or too little access to the health care. Meaning they don't have proper health care and they don't have a pop proper guidance when they go through this adolescent period. Meeting young adults' diverse needs challenges the parents, community, healthcare providers, and also the educators. So what we can do from our side? Efforts by the medical practitioners. So every medical practitioner, mainly the gynecologist, has a major role in the development of the adolescent and the quality of life of the adolescent period. So adolescents who live in a gray zone between the pediatric, gynecology or young adulthood are often neglected and many of the problems are ignored, trivialized as being a part of growing up. So whatever problem they, they, are, they are encountering has to be addressed immediately. It has to be started from the home, then from the school and also uh, medical practitioners should uh, be able to reach out the adolescent students, adolescent girls, and to know their problems. So every gynecologist should participate and guide in school health clinics for, clean, uh, for girls and boys separately. For many issues, if the girls are separated and if the, if the talk is given for the girls alone separately, many issues will come out and that can be easily sorted out. So clinics for girls and boys separately has to be done. And for few topics, it can be done in common for both girls and boys. Gynecologists support in adolescent age group when a girl grows from childhood to womanhood has a great implication on her health and overall development. Hence, special attention should be given to this age group. Medical professionals can play a key role between policy makers, parents, educators, and young adults. So sex education and reproductive health care program for our young adults often face opposition. But research shows that these programs do not lead to more frequent or earlier sex as opponent feels. But rather, it will improve the quality of life. It will avoid unprotected uh, sex and also it will prevent teenage pregnancy or early pregnancy and unwanted pregnancies and never this promotes earlier sex okay so sex education is must and reproductive health program is must for all young adults and it has to be initiated in the school school days itself between 12 to 17 years to win public support such programs must work with parents medical professions and within community norms need for compulsory interaction with the young girls in schools especially between 10 to 17 years of age is must. Making them aware of normal physiological or normal physiology of reproduction, health and discussing all issues related to sexuality and contraception 
is again a need and it is a must. So our effort can contribute significantly to their safety, confidence and entry into adulthood. Service for young people should always be youth friendly, which means attention needs to be given to six C's. What are the six C's? Confidentiality, convenience, care, counseling, cost and community support. So considering all these six C's, attention has to be paid to the young growing adolescence. So what is puberty? Puberty is characterized by physical sexual differentiation and by the onset of activity of sex organs. So uh, Tanner has staged the development from the puberty to the adulthood into five different stages and puberty has is consisting of menarche, philarche and danjarche. So what is menarche? Menarche is onset of menstruation and is merely one manifestation of the puberty. Then other signs are tilak and anjar. So what is tilak? Tilak is development of the breast. So here it is deposited from the stage one to the stage five. Stage five is fully matured adult and stage one is the initial stage. So from the stage one to the stage two, stage three and stage four development and to the adult size. This development is staged by the tanners and this is called development of breast that is tilak. And anjak is the development of the sexual hairs that is also staged from stage 1 to stage 5 where stage 1 is the beginning of the phase and stage 5 is the end and the adolescent, adult grown up adult phase. So what are the other changes that happens during puberty and it continues throughout the adolescent period till the adult period. So main thing that peaks in the adolescent period is rapid growth spurt. Then body changes like breast development, pubital and axillary hair growth, that is the sexual hairs. Then fat deposition, curvy body, menstruation, oily skin, acne and skin blemish, and menses. How we will guide the adolescent for sleep and diet? Adolescent period is aged between 13 to 18 years or 19 years, that is the teenage period. Whoever is in this age group should sleep at least between 8 to 10 hours per day. That is for 24 hours. So chronic sleep deprivation which is less than 7 hours can lead to excessive sleepiness in the daytime, lack of concentration, fatigue, depression, irritability, eating disorders and obesity. So sleep is very very important. Proper sleep hygiene has to be maintained. Sleep hygiene is maintained by developing a clean environment for sleeping and also a dark and comfortable environment. Uh, stick, so how can we uh, improve the sleeping habits? Sticking to a consistent time and consistent sleeping schedule during the school week and also the weekends. So sleeping for more time in the Sundays and then sleeping in the late night and Saturdays has to be avoided. And limited light exposure and technology use in the evening has to be avoided. Technologies like gadgets, mobiles, laptops or whatever has to be avoided in the night time. Before bed, at least two hours before bed, it has to be avoided. And while sleeping, adequate uh, this thing, uh, darkness has to be maintained. And meditation before sleep improves the quality of sleep. About diet, every meal should be balanced diet with the following components. Vegetables and whole fruits has to be taken for the half of the plate. So a meal, uh, you have to divide the plate into two. In that, half of the plate should consist of raw vegetables and cooked vegetables and also the fruits. In that half, uh, three-fourths of the plate should con consist of cooked and uh, raw, fruit, raw vegetables and also a quarter of the plate of that half should consist of fruits and the next half should consist of whole grains like complex carbohydrate and of that half other half should consist of proteins okay so adequate uh, oil and ghee should be taken in the moderation 
water has to be taken for two to three liters per day or six to eight glasses of water per day vitamins minerals and probiotic foods like curds and everything has to be taken for a proper balanced child so, menstrual hygiene the girl has a time when happy she is new and uh, she's menstruating for the first time or in the first few years the proper menstrual hygiene has to be taught for her and personal hygiene must be emphasized to girls of this age other than daily bath washing in the private areas and armpits with mild soap and water washing scalp ha scalp and hair at least twice a week trimming nails and keep hair lice free brushing teeth twice a day rinsing with sufficient water and wearing clean undergarments and and clothes it is important to have regular schedule with meals sleep study play and exercise it should not vary between the weekdays and the weekend days so every day the schedule has to be same and undergarments has to be changed at least once twice in a day and it should be in cotton preferably synthetic gar undergarments has to be avoided because if the aeration is not sufficient that can prone for infections so menstrual hygiene what are the menstrual hygiene wearing sanitary pads or the cloth pads whatever they are using after a shower with a fresh pair of cotton pants it has to be worn and changing pad as soon as it soak towards the edges or completely it is soaked or it has to be changed every fourth hourly whichever is earlier if the pad is soaked in the edges it has to be changed immediately or if it is soaked completely it has to be changed immediately or every fourth hours if either of this has not occurred if the pad is not fully soaked it has to be changed this uh, disrespect of the soakage of the pad it has to be changed every fourth hourly whichever is earlier it has to be done and wash the private area thoroughly during shower and if possible during every change with the faucet use tissue or a designated soft towel to wipe off the excess water before putting a new pad or the undergarment so every time when you use you use a cotton undergarment and it has to be cha changed at least twice a day cotton undergarments or any undergarments they are using has to be washed dried and it has to be sun dried if they are using re reusable cotton pads they have it has to be washed thoroughly until the it first it has to be soaked until the stain is removed after that it has to be washed thoroughly and it has to be sun dried if not that that will be the source of infection for initial few days it is better to use sanitary pads made of cotton not the reusable cotton pads if the flow is associated with clots it is usually will be heavy so when we will call it as heavy menses when a flow is associated with clot it is called as heavy menses in general the entire menstrual flow is about 20 to 50 ml and if it exceeds 80 ml it is considered as heavy menstrual flow since menstrual blood flow cannot be measured a rough guide would be looked for like so cage of large pad completely every second hourly so if it is soaking for thoroughly it is okay that to for first to three days after that if it is still prolonging if the duration of menses is going to prolong that is also considered as heavy menstrual flow so soaking of a large pad completely every two hourly then passing clots flooding in the toilet staining bed linen feeling tired and exhausted feeling exhausted having palpitation these are the signs of heavy menstrual bleeding of this the last three contributes to the anemia that is as a result of heavy menstrual bleeding so anemia should not be there if we are leaving the patient to go to that level then that that is the complication of the heavy menstrual bleeding so it has to be identified in the first three points itself like from the flooding of the toilet soaking large pads completely for every two hours and passage of clots so these things at this point you have to identify before the patient or before the girl is proceeding to the feeling tiredness exhausted giddiness and all that which is the sign of anemia 
So if in this case, it would be prudent to check for any underlying cause of heavy bleeding, such as bleeding or coagulation disorder. All these things mainly exist. This bleeding disorder or coagulation disorder are mainly seen in puberty menorrhagia. That is in the initial days of menses, initial few years, one to two, three years of mens uh, as soon as menses starts. So that period you have to check. Then any thyroid problems, any hypothyroid or hypothyroid has to be ruled out by doing thyroid function test. Then evaluation of anemia. Anemia per se will cause heavy menstrual bleeding and heavy menstrual bleeding will in turn result in anemia. So an evaluation by, by a gynecologist is essential for necessary investigation and treatment. Then the next topic in adolescence is polycystic ovarian syndrome in adolescent. So in the first three years, first two to three years of menstruation is considered, even if it is irregular, it is considered because of the immaturity of the hypothalamic pituitary ovarian axis. So once this first three years has crossed and if still there is irregularity in the menses and associated with features of hyperandrogenism, then it is considered as polycystic ovarian syndrome. So what is polycystic ovarian syndrome? Is one of the most common endocrinopathy in the reproductive age group and often present in late adolescent. It is not present in the early adolescent, rather it will be presented in late adolescent. Polycystic ovarian syndrome is a potent manifestation with a variable combination of menstrual irregularity, hirsutism, acne, and obesity, which in turn are manifestation of hyperandrogenism and also metabolic disorder as a sequelae. That is why it is called a syndrome. How to diagnose it? Rotterdam has the, defined a criteria for diagnosis of polycystic ovarian disease. So two of three of the following criteria as a prerequisite for polycystic ovarian syndrome. So what are the three criteria? Chronic anovulation or oligomenorrhea for more than six months then clinical or biochemical hyperandrogenism and polycystic ovarian morphology. So what is polycystic ovarian morphology? How we will diagnose polycystic ovary? So with the ultrasound. In an ultrasound, if there is going to be bulky ovary, of more than 10 to 12 cubic uh, millimeter, or if it is going to be, if the follicle, number of follicles are more than 20, 12 to 20, then it is considered as polycystic ovary and that there is a classical presentation of the follicles that are arranged peripherally like a necklace pattern uh, multiple follicles arranged in the peripheries like a necklace it is called polycystic ovary and also the number and the size of the follicles also matters if the each follicles are more than 12 millimeter then also it is considered as polycystic ovary So what are the symptoms? Menstrual irregularities. The late, the onset of polycystic ovary may, uh, may occur in adolescent, beginning with irregular menstrual cycle, which persists for more than three years after menarche. So it has to be persistent for more than three years after menarche. And uh, the menstrual irregularities may manifest as oligomenorrhea, polymenorrhea, and uh, at times, primary amenorrhea or secondary amenorrhea, dysfunctional uterine bleeding. These are some of the manifestations of polycystic ovarian disease. How do they present with? Next thing, they will present with hirsutism. Hirsutism is a classical feature of androgen excess that is hyperandrogen state of polycystic ovarian syndrome and is found in about two thirds of the cases. It is not required to present as hyperandrogenic feature or the metabolic syndrome or obesity or purely this thing. There is even existence of lean PCOS. So that has to be considered. There are different morphology of polycystic ovarian syndrome. Of that, in these three variations, anything can occur. So the next one is hirsutism is excessive sexual hair that appears in the male pattern, meaning there is facial hair hairs in the upper lip, in the chin, then in the inner thigh, abdomen, and also in the chest region, and also in the back, which is, which is distributed in the male pattern. Okay, then obesity is present in 50% of the patients 
with PCOS, that is polycystic ovarian syndrome, which is typically android in type. That is central obesity with a waist circumference more than 88 centimeter after sexual maturity is attained. And also in these girls, the waist hip ratio will be more. So other cutaneous signs of androgen excess are acne, seborrhea, and alopecia or hyperthyrosis. So what are the, uh, how do they present? As I said earlier, there will be hirsutism, excessive hair growth in the male pattern, bodily sexual hair growth. Okay. So then the obesity, in obese, uh, usually in obese patients, there will be metabolic syndrome associated. That is the insulin sensitivity or the insulin resistance. Decreased insulin sensitivity will be there. That is the insulin resistance that is encountered in these girls. And uh, it is also the dermatological or cutaneous manifestation is acanthosis nigricans, which is a dark velvety patches, hyperpigmented patches that is seen in the nape of the neck, inner thighs, and in the armpit. So it has to be correlated with decreased insulin sensitivity and the insulin resistance. So how do we investigate? First thing to look for the, the nature of the ovary type of the polycystic ovary, we have to look for the ultrasound. We will do an ultrasound, abdomen and pelvis, mainly the pelvis, to look for the ovary, number of follicles, the pattern of follicles that is arranged and size of each follicles and volume of the ovary has to be measured. Then a testosterone, serum testosterone has to be measured by total and free testosterone has to be measured. Then dihydroepist androstenedione, DHEAS has to be seen. Then fasting, uh, fasting blood sugar, then 17 hydroxyprogesterone, thyroid stimulating hormone, free T3, free T3 and T4 has to be measured. Then prolactin, fasting glucose, fasting insulin has to be checked. How do we manage weight loss for obesity? Then suppression of elevated male hormone levels that causes hyperandrogenism and its associated symptoms such as hirsutism and acne has to be looked for. Restoration of the normal menses. See, what is the goal? Restoration of the normal menses to aid promote weight loss and obesity has to be reduced. Then suppression of the elevated male hormone levels, that is the testosterone hormone. Okay, hyperandrogenism has to be corrected. Then its associated symptoms like hirsutism and acne has to be corrected. Alopecia has to be corrected. Then reversing insulin resistance. The, you have to improve the sensitive, sensitize the insulin. Okay, so insulin resistance has to be improved and thereby restoring the normal metabolic and hormonal function. So then preventing the long-term health complication that can occur as consequence of polycystic ovarian syndrome. Okay, so what are the long-term complications? It is cardiovascular complication. Okay, and the diabetes mellitus. So our goal is aimed at management of these things. So how do we manage? Either by giving a combined oral contraceptive pills or a progestin. And insulin sensitizing agents like metformin can be given. Then anti-androgens to reduce the hyperandrogenic features. Topical treatment for acne and various treatment for hair removal like lasers can be suggested. Then 5-alpha reductase creams can be suge suggested. After dependent on patient symptoms and concern. So, depending on the patient's concern or the symptoms, the treatment is prescribed. Healthy eating and regular exercise and for weight, overweight adolescents, weight reduction by physical activity for every day, at least a 45 for a 45 minutes, there should be brisk walk or some kind of physical activity to reduce the weight. Okay, and also to improve the insulin sensitization. Then are encouraged to reduce the risk of cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes mellitus. So these girls with polycystic ovarian syndrome with metabolic disorders are more prone for cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes their early age, early 30s or in the 40s itself. So numerous studies have shown that weight loss and exercise decreases the androgen levels and improves insulin sensitivity and lead to resumption of ovulation. 
So before proceeding to the medical management, start with lifestyle modification, avoid oily, oily foods, eat a balanced diet, adequate sleep and physical activity will improve the symptoms in most of the cases. The next topic is the vaginal discharge in adolescence. It is important to note that amount of color, consistency, order and presence of pruritus and relationship with the menstrual cycle to categorize the vaginal discharge into physiological and pathological. So this discharge is composite of vulval secretion from Bartholin's gland, sweat gland, sebaceous and apocrine gland, vaginal transudate consisting of epithelial cells, electrolytes, proteins, lactic acid, dodalin bacilli, cervical mucus secretion, and endometrial fluid. So this is the composition of a normal vaginal secretion. So any alteration in this secretion can result in pathological manifestation. For a proper adequate vaginal secretion, vaginal pH has to be maintained. If there is any alteration in the vaginal pH, there can be colonization of other common cells, bacteria, and result in infection. So, in certain amount of vaginal secretion, in a certain, a certain amount of vaginal secretion, enough to cause moist feeling is quite normal. So, the physiological vaginal discharge will be clear white discharge, may be increased in the ovulatory and premenstrual phase of menstrual cycle. But this physiological increased leucorrhea is never associated with order or itching. So, there is no order, foul smelling or itch in the physiological secretion. So, in young girls, it may present premenarchal, where it signifies the onset of folliculogenesis. Before attaining the first menses, these girls, few girls may present with white discharge. That signifies the folliculogenesis and steroidogenesis by ovary. In fact, a certain amount of discharge can occur in female newborn in the first few days due to effect of maternal and placental hormones. So, leukorrhea is also seen in pregnancy, sexual excitement and in cervical ectopia. So, it is associated with anemia, chronic ill health, anxiety and use of external hormones like oral contraceptive pills. So, while taking a history, we have to ask about the history of chronic ill health. We should rule out anemia and also ask for the history of oral contraceptive intakes. Vaginal discharge in teenager have varied reason. It may be an excess of physiological discharge or it can be a pathological discharge. So, a good history and examination depending on the age, symptoms, sexual history is required with prompt treatment in order to prevent adverse reproductive sequence. If a pathological discharge, if there is a vaginal infection or if it's a valvo vaginitis, if it is not treated promptly, it can lead to frequent reproductive sequence, adverse sequence. So that has to be borne in mind. An adequate history for her examination has to be taken. So sound nutritional advice has to be given. Prevention of anemia is must. Any uh, to diagnose any chronic illness and treat the chronic illness and counseling about the menstrual and sexual hygiene along with the promotion of sexual abstinence that is very very important in teenagers and safe sex and barrier contraception is essential for growing years. What are the causes of pathological discharge? Pathological vaginal discharge can be due to trauma, foreign body, or any wounds or abrasions and chemical burns, etc. So any girl, young girls present with sudden onset of blood stained or purulent discharge should have foreign body or trauma or growth excluded. So examine the vulva and the vaginal region for any trauma, abrasion or chemical burns, for any signs of abuse or any signs of foreign body insertion. So it has to be examined properly if possible. For all cases, do her rectal examination. Her vaginal examination is reserved for married girls and not for the virgin girls. So, a proper examination, her abdominal examination, 
local examination and parietal examination can aid us in diagnosing foreign bodies and also an ultrasound can be taken for guidance. So infections in any form, vulvovaginitis due to trichomonas vaginalis, bacterial vaginosis, candida albicans can cause pathological vaginal secretion. Cervicitis is mainly caused due to Neisseria gonorrhea, chlamydia, and endometritis or endometritis, which may be because of post-abortal or postpartum can result in pathological vaginal secretion or due to tuberculosis, that is tubercular endometritis. This can also result in pathological vaginal secretion. So in India, any teenager, especially if a girl is virgin with a discharge, presenting with vaginal discharge that is foul smelling, altered in color and the consistency with chronic pain and amenorrhea, chronic pelvic pain and amenorrhea should be investigated for tuberculosis. Okay, so that is tubercular endometritis has to be ruled out. Infections are the commonest cause of vaginal discharge. So vaginal infection like candidiasis, trichomoniasis, bacterial vaginosis give rise to vaginal discharge with itchy. So any cervical infection of chlamydia or gonorrhea may present with blood-stained mucoprolent discharge, postcoital bleeding, and lower abdominal pain. So any patient who is presenting with postcoital bleeding, that, that is why for all adolescent girls, a proper detailed history has to be taken and a sexual history has to be taken. If she is exposed or if she is abused, all those history has to be taken. And uh, while taking history, adequate confidentiality has to be maintained. So, uh, young friendly or uh, detailed history has to be obtained. Then, so any cervical infection with the chlamydia and gonorrhea will present with blood stained discharge and it will be mucoprolent, that is greenish or yellowish discharge with the postpartum bleeding, history of postpartum bleeding, and lower abdominal pain. So, candidal infection, candidiasis infection occurs in 75% of the women once in their lifetime. At least once in their lifetime, every woman, about 75% of the women, is exposed to candidal infection. So, what are the other pathological causes for vaginal discharge? That is tumor, which may be benign or malignant. So it has to be ruled out. Any cervical polyp may present with white, creamy, non-offensive discharge, but soon it may get ulcerated and infected, resulting in pathological, purulent, offensive, foul-smelling, okay, blood-stained discharge. And consistency can also be thick, yellowish or greenish consistency if it is infected, depending on the organism that is causing infection. Then malignant growth, though it is rare in adolescents, may cause profuse bloody discharge and it has to be ruled out. So fistulas, either it can be congenital fistulas or due to trauma or any foreign body infection or due to abuse or obstetric injury can result in urinary leak or causal discharge from the vagina, which is foul smelling and it can irritate the vagina causing perineal skin excoriation. The next topic is teenage pregnancy and its impact on adults in, and its impact on reproductive health of an adolescent. So a teenage pregnancy is considered as a high-risk pregnancy. It is not only a medical entity but also reality in social problem. So it is a high-risk teenage pregnancy. Every teenage pregnancy is high-risk in medical as well as social problem. So, in recent years, the incidence of teenage pregnancy has significantly risen with devastating consequences for adolescent mothers, their infants, and society as well. So, teenage is time of emotional upheaval when a dual adjustment required as a girl herself is growing up. It is like child taking care of another child. So, in developing countries, more teenage pregnancies or married girls compared to West, where most teenagers are unwed mothers. So, study in India shows an incidence ranging from 3.2 to 11.8% of teenage pregnancy 
what is the leading cause for teenage pregnancy? Either it is physiological, social influence, economical factor, access to healthcare services less, or individual cause, or any sexual abuse. So, physiological. So, in adolescent period, there is blooming of sexual desire and explosion of the sexual organs and the all adventures, adventurous need. So, it is a dramatic phys physical and physiological changes that happens that leads to early sexual exposure and resulting in teenage pregnancy and early sexual activity that results in teenage pregnancy without a proper protection uh, in case of early sexual activity the girl can end up in teenage pregnancy social influence cultural and religious causes that results in early marriage and early marriage with the unprotected intercourse can result in pregnancy explosion of youth by media early age pregnancy in mother and peer pressure can result in teenage pregnancy and mainly in developing countries like india the early marriage is the main cause and also abuse sexual abuse that is the next cause so social socioeconomic factors poor employment poverty and housing condition make them get married early and having teenage pregnancy access to health services where there is lack of health and sex education can result in earlier unprotected intercourse and resulting in pregnancy and lack of awareness and the ability of contraception that also results in early pregnancy so individual reasons are poor academic performance and low self esteem then social abuse common attendance 66% in all pregnancies and sex against will is about 72%. So what are the adverse effects of the teenage pregnancy? The adverse effects of teenage pregnancies are social and medical adverse effect. So a social adverse effect, lower educational attainment, limited career opportunity, poverty, familial conflict, depression, and medical causes or lack of perinatal care, preterm delivery, preeclampsia, anemia, low birth weight, sepsis, and all these things can lead to depression. Prevention of teenage pregnancy, it is important, requires a multifaceted approach, including education, focused healthcare service, socio-economic support and contraceptive counseling. So different stages of prevention would include primary prevention, secondary prevention, and tertiary prevention. Each prevention aims at different levels. First, primary prevention is preventing the child from the exposure of early marriage or early sex. And secondary prevention is providing contraceptions and uh, advising them to be abstain, abstained from the sexual activity. Tertiary prevention aims at safe abortion and other uh, protective effects. So in primary prevention, abstain from sex. is That is the main thing. That is what we have to counsel them. Then cultural attitudes, avoiding early marriage, improved education, health and sex education, socio economic status has to be improved so these are the primary prevention so what are the risk factors you have to identify the risk factors and correct the risk factors in primary prevention to prevent early marriage and improve the education and so we have discussed lack of education low performance poor socio-economic status so all those things has to be corrected in, in the primary prevention state to avoid teenage pregnancy in the secondary stage, as the girl is already exposed or the girl is already married, you can use contraception, you can avoid pregnancy or you can postpone pregnancy, you can avoid teenage pregnancy, and emergency contraception can be given. In case of unexpected exposure or unplanned coitus, or in case of sexual abuse or rape, emergency contraception has to be given and adequate proper counseling has to be given for the girl. 
to improve her quality of life. If the girl has become pregnant, in tertiary prevention, the girl has actually become pregnant, we have to give adequate, safe abortion service and confidential abortion service has to be given. Any teenage pregnancy has to be reported to the police and it is a it POSCO Act comes into play. So it has to be reported. It is an emergency case. And adequate prenatal care has to be given for the girl. So teenage pregnancy is considered as high risk from social and biological point of view, which prevent being a challenging task needing special attention. So a multi-phased approach involving provision of education, health service, and socio-economic support are to be worn together in tackling this problem of teenage pregnancy, provision of contraception, counseling including emergency contraception can be helpful in preventing most of these unwanted pregnancies. So sex education, improving socio-economic status, improving the counseling and girls, sex education, advice on contraception, give, uh, giving uh, adequate protection and abstinence from sex activity and proper counseling, emergency contraception and if needed safe abortion services can result in prevention of teenage pregnancy and improve the quality of life of an adolescent. So educational status thereby is improved and family life is improved and the socio-economic status is in turn improved in this uh, measures. So there is a need, there is also a need to strengthen safe abortion service for adolescents that is very, very important in case of unexpected exposure where there is failure of emergency contraception or failure of contraception, safe abortion service has to be provided along with confidential uh, support, proper counseling for teenage pregnancy, proper counseling for adolescent uh, and guide to go through the all changes, the social, cultural, family, family, and also the peer support will improve the girl's quality of life and result in healthy adolescence. Thank you.